only one week ago, I was, uh, I and uh, probably a lot of you were shocked as well, but very surprised to learn that one of the most beloved companies in Silicon Valley announced that they had lost, or they had been hacked basically, and lost 500 million, 500 million customer accounts. Uh, it's a mind-boggling number, right? Chances are many, many of us were in the 500 million of that situation that, had, that was announced on the 26th. Uh, and I think you know what company, a Silicon Valley company, very well known, been around for a very long time. Maybe some of you had fun memories of somebody you made way back when, when, when it was all the rage. Uh, but, but it's really a sad, sad statement when something like that happens. They announced that uh, usernames, uh, emails, uh, phone numbers, uh, hash passwords, uh, even security questions, some encrypted, some decrypted even, were hacked, right? And then I thought, well, that happened because it's a company in Silicon Valley that you all know and love, and they were a target. But then I, I looked, I looked at, I, I, I Googled what the top 10, top 10 breaches in the last year, and you know what I found? I found uh, healthcare companies, two of them in the top 10, uh, media gaming company, uh, a bank, healthcare, insurance, you name it, right? Probably I named some industries, not probably, I'm sure that many of you are related with or working in right now. So the message is that nobody's immune and the hackers are going after all of them, right? And what happens is that's making this topic a topic of conversation at every level, right? This is a me reason to fire the CIO type topic or the CTO or the CSO or all three, right? Uh, boards of directors are discussing this. CEOs are learning what authentication is, right? Many of them had no clue or never cared, but now they care a lot, right? So what's happening is that these conversations are occurring right now. And if, if they were ever worried, they might have been, but for sure you were, about the employee identities, right? Now they're really concerned about the consumer identities. What happens to the login of my patients, my consumers, my gamers, right? How do I keep those safe? And that's a conversation that you, we hope, will be equipped to have in a very meaningful, practical way. In fact, you will be able to hopefully create some POCs in your companies about a technology that, that uh, Azure AD, uh, Azure Active Directory has uh, recently come out with. Let me go to the next slide. Uh, my colleague Swarup, Krishna Murthy, and I, uh, we've been working on an evolution of Azure AD. And let me, could you flip me to the next? This one didn't respond. Oh, there you go. I just had to be patient. Uh, have been working on a technology taking all the capabilities, specifically the security, the scalability that you all know and love, I hope, and Azure AD via Office 365 or directly via Azure AD. And we've taken it with a team of brilliant engineers and made it available to your customers, through you, of course, right? What we're saying is we're going to put all the, all the security and scalability that Fortune 500 companies across the world, I hope many of yours are included, and many medium and small companies as well, are trusting, right, increasingly, one of Microsoft's most successful products and all the investment that going, that's going into it to benefit your security of your consumers, right? But to get this done, we also knew that it was not all about security. And the talk today, it's not about security, right? It's about a very specific service that we want to tell you about that gets you in the door with the CIO, many of you might be CIOs yourselves, or get you in the door to talk to the CEO and say, I have something we need to implement yesterday, right? So the, you get through the door talking about security, but you get the support of all your peers because there's benefits here that we're going to talk about for marketing, benefits for your line of business, benefits for your business partners, benefits for your software and the manageability of what, what we think we've developed for you, and most importantly, benefits for your customers. Not only because they're secure, but they'll be able to see experiences that look and feel like the experiences of your own websites, of your own apps, right? That you'll be able to share these identities in a very secure way with all the applications. So the talk today is going to be technical. We want to arm you to walk out the door saying, I am ready to do a POC. I just saw how this works. I can do it. And to take it and think about what are the incremental ways that within your, one of your companies, you can start testing this out, maybe with some employees. Uh, Microsoft, by the way, used, it, used our service 
So many of you used it when you logged in to some of the events, some of the, some of the work that we're doing here at, at Ignite. Right? So there are many stealthy ways to put it in and begin to figure it out and gain some confidence yourself with it and see if it fits. Uh, for, the, for the next few minutes, uh, I, I have a few requests. Uh, let's hold questions towards the end. We're going to make sure we allocate time for that. But we're going to you, walk you through some demos that will cover some, some span of territory, and we hope that it, uh, it, it lights, some lights turn on in there. Uh, and I have two questions. Question number one, just show of hands. How many of you already know what Azure AD B2C is? Show of hands. Fantastic. Related to that, how many of you have already done a POC or coded or integrated an app, even if it's just for yourselves? OK. OK, very good. So that looks like this. The first question, pretty much everybody, which I'm very, very excited to hear. And for a second, it looked like just, just under half of you have already done some of the things we're going to show you. So we, we aim to both show you how, but also a little bit how to talk about it and really what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, there's a lot of relevance to some presentations that Vittorio, our colleague, uh, Bert Bertucci, uh, have covered regarding how to connect to web apps and how to connect to mobile apps. Uh, there's a lot of relevance today with a presentation that will happen tomorrow by our colleague and good friend Sarat uh, with B2B, right? Because the same issues that we just talked about, about protection, but even more issues with collaboration with partners come up as well. Today we're going to talk about the consumer, patients, citizen side, kind of your users, right? Usually it tends to be the people who pay, you know, who pay the, make, make, make the revenue work, right, in your companies. Um, but tomorrow we have the sister, uh, the sister service B2B on the same foundation uh, that Sarah is going to talk about. And we're going to call out some distinctions. So to bring this to life, let's go to one of our favorite examples. And that's Real Madrid. So Real Madrid, their concerns did not begin with security. Their concerns began with scale. Right? So Real Madrid is the largest football club in the world. Some of you might not think it's the best, but certainly they are the largest. Right? Um, extremely well known. They think their fans number in the, in the billions. right? and global franchise, and they did not have a modern way to tr keep track of and really kind of gain access or provide access to their customers. Along, along with their brand, the experience, the digital, the digital side of their brand had to shine through, right? So we had to be there to provide their needs, but we really had to be kind of out of the way. And that's what I, I hope to show you, that we're there, but we're out of the way. Microsoft should not be part of the journeys of your customers other than providing the security and the infrastructure. It's all your brand, all your look is the way you should have it. Um, at the same time, their scale drove huge problems, right? Because on, 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 uh, on, on game night or match night, uh, they have a gigantic spike, which, which graph when we observe and we feel like, like it moves the needle across Azure AD not just B2C, but across Azure AD, the needle actually moves and people see the blip, right? When all their players go online and start logging into the app. In fact, when they launched their app with B2C, both iOS and Android, they rose quickly within the first few days to the top of the iOS and Android stores, right, for their apps. And B2C handled it with no sweat. That's the kind of scale we want to provide and, and, and bring to you. So why don't we go right into a quick demo? So I want to show you what, uh, what is it that they were so keen on, and along the way, start talking a little bit about how it works and what's happening behind the scenes. So I'm assured that that will turn white shortly. There you go. So let's go with that. So let's go ahead and go to their, uh, their, their website. So what B2C does, right, in a nutshell, what B2C does is a delegation of authentication. You probably have experienced it very much when you use your, your SaaS apps, but we brought that to the, to the consumer world. So very simply, we're in the Real Madrid web, uh, website. Um, everything observe the branding and you know the, the, the dynamics of the website that has to continue. So a, a customer might go choose to log in, and within that, uh, there's a second choice that's just part of their structure. But uh, notice the URL; it goes from their website, realmadrid.com, and the user chooses to sign in. What just happened is that. Real Madrid said, Microsoft, take care of the authentication. If it's a good one, come back and tell me what happened. Otherwise, tell me as well, but I don't have to worry about anything else. That's what Real Madrid is thinking. You take care of this for us. But I want it to look just right. So at the very top of the URL, you see uh, a, a new domain that they created, login.realmadrid.com. 
Uh, you also see uh, here with my cursor is, you also see the policy, and we'll, we'll be a little more clear about what that means as we continue to talk, that they invoked to begin this journey, this user, user path. And uh, the customer, in this case, they're just gonna log in. They're just gonna create a new account. This is, a, uh, this is to sign up. I wanna show you that, that. It invokes a specific sign up journey. And I'm just gonna go ahead and provide a, um, provide login credentials. So first thing they, they chose to do is uh, ask for the, for the customer's credentials. They go ahead and send out a, a verification. So I'm gonna go to my Outlook, log in to check where I might have gotten my, my code. For now. Yep, thank you. Sneaky. Thank you. There you go. Okay. So the first thing they decided to do, they're gonna check the so check the emails. This is a huge improvement for them because they now they now are cleaning being cleaning up their database to make sure that they have good emails and they use them in major ways to market to their customer. This has been an eternal problem in PRS experiences in banking. It was always a problem to keep that updated and make sure that you had good information on your customers. So I'm logging into my, my email box as any user would. There comes, comes my code from Real Madrid, um, branded with their logo, and this is the code I need. So I'm just gonna take it and prove that I need to have access to this email through Real Madrid. Here we go. Verify the code. B2C continues the journey, so the next page is also B2C, right? This experience, you get to uh, choose it yourself. I'm gonna go ahead and set up a page in them. One thing I chose to do in this experience is that I could have chosen Facebook, I could have chosen Google to log in, and I'll show you how that looks like very shortly, but in this case, I selected a local account. This means that I want an account that I'm only gonna use with Real Madrid and nobody else, uh, and this is something I'm sure you've experienced yourselves. Great. Um, so all these questions and queries are uh, B2C pr uh, provides them. Okay, let's go with that. Uh, doesn't much matter at this point. Oops. Okay, so see B2C is enforcing uh, some rules that uh, Real Madrid decided to put in here as to what information is susceptible, and B2C would check that. Uh, there is the option to check the phone as well. We thought that was necessary via MFA. In this case, we're not going to do that. Uh, all these all this forms, forms and statements here that I, I provide are also, not only is B2C asking this, the B2C is going to register this information to make it available to the application and any future audits and other information that's required, right? So think of it of a, as an, a, not only authentication, but an add-on to your CRM system. Push continue. So at this point, uh, I had a, Did I cross the screen? Oh, there you go. So I'm right back at the Real Madrid website and logged in as Jose Rojas. So along the way, the app, the application collected information, the B2C collected information and provided it to the application, including my name. But it could have included any other information I provided, and I'll show you in a second how that would look like. So to show you an alternative screen, let's just go very quickly to uh, a video I have here that I want to talk you through. The, the flow, the way it would look like in an app using Google. So notice how I had all those questions I had to answer. And that was because the policy indicated what are the questions that the user had to, had to answer. If, however, you were to go to a Google app, and I'm just gonna quickly throw it, sorry, I shouldn't say Google app, this is our Windows app. Uh, and in this journey, the user goes to, to the Windows S Store app uh, for Real Madrid, and they're going to effect a sign up. And I'll just talk you through it very quickly. So the user goes to the app, this is the Windows app. The user chooses, to, chooses Google as their identity provider. Obviously, this is a, real, a choice that Real Madrid applied. Um, a window comes up. Within the window here is actually uh, redirected to B2C, redirecting to Google, who's providing the, where you're providing the credentials. You have the usual consent screen, right? So that Google now has record of this app coming in and the consent screen. It goes back to B2C. A similar form is provided, but notice how, how much shorter it is. It's adjusted because this is a, usually used in a tablet, you're welcome to use it in your phones as well, even as we speak, and you'll see that, right? So they minimized the number of questions to speed up the login, and the, the account was created, right? 
something else that their app has done, and this is, that was their decision. They now also map, the, based on the email, they now, the user, the same user could come from different locations and they actually keep track of them. So I've logged in with different, different systems and based on the email, they match the user. That's something that they decided to use, giving their users multiple choices on how to log in. So that, in a nutshell, is what B2C does for your users. Now let's, um, let's go back uh, here and talk a little bit about what is the, what are the, the pieces and parts of B2C. So Azure Active Directory B2C is a cloud service, as you might, might come to know Azure AD B2C. And uh, we talked about the scale, we talked about the experience. Something we haven't mentioned too much is the cost effectiveness. We'll come back a little later to give you specifics, but we've designed this to be an alternative that is better by far. You should be able to make the business case, no problem to anything that you currently have and anything you could even look at with competitors. Uh, we want this to absolutely not be an issue. And the TCO being very important because all the maintenance, ongoing updates, service, 24-7 support will come by Microsoft, right? And lastly, the important point is developer focused. So our service is there to allow developers to focus on, on, on the app, focus on developing the great website, developing the great, uh, sorry, the great uh, Android application. Right? All the details that really can make your company money, if you will, and getting the, the authentication to be quite simple. We aspire that the authentication can be managed without code. It's not 100% there because the application does have to have some code to interact with us, but it's really, really quite minimal. And we do this in a way that it's uh, uh, completely open standards based. B2C, it's an independent service which you could choose to use with any other cloud, cloud service, competitor or not. You could use with on-prem, on-prem applications if you wanted to, right? It has the ability to be completely open standards and it can, it can work for any kind of uh, internet, internet accessible application for you. Now, um, when it comes to IT pros or developers, uh, we consider B2C to be aimed towards developers. But we also see in situations where the IT department is increasingly asked to mine the store when it comes to the identities of the users. So we'd love to hear from you guys. So, just show of hands, how many of you guys, guys and gals, are oriented towards developers on your day-to-day -to -day job versus IT? Show of hands. And then IT, the balance? Okay, good, good to see that, good to see that. We really do think this is a topic that's relevant for both, right? We really do see that this kind of blends the two because what I'm going to show you is something that could very well be managed and the policies could be written and it could be supported by IT pros who wish to and are being tasked to do that whereas the application developers come to you to get access to the policies that we're, we're going to show you. So with that, I would like to show you what, it, what this looks like for the developers. So let's go ahead and go back to our site here, and we're going to uh, go to our B2C tenant. I'm going to log in. I, I chose to go to portal.azure.com. Let me just make sure you guys can see that. Oh, I apologize. Thank you about that. So I'm going to portal.azure.com. I'm going to log in uh, specifically into our, uh, into our tenant. I've created an, a local user in the tenant, just plain called admin. You can also log in with your Microsoft account. Let's fix that. Okay. So within the Azure portal that I hope some of you or all of you have become familiar with, we've, uh, we've, uh, we've now logged into a specific tenant that uh, looks like any other tenant in many purposes, you have many of the like Azure AD tenants, but the Azure AD B2C tenant has specific characteristics. We've already created that. You can look online, how do you get, how do you get to there? And then we choose to then open the specific extension within Azure of B2C. This is the extension, our admin slash developer portal, if you will, that will allow you to set things up the way I showed you that Real Madrid has used. By the way, Real Madrid is consuming, Real Madrid is consuming the same service I'm going to show you, the same exact service. Everything that they've done, they've done through this particular uh, portal that I'm showing you. 
Great. So once you're inside the tenant, the core unit of B2C is a policy. And a policy describes what is the journey, what are the requirements that must be met for a user to be properly authenticated. Right? And what are the options that you're going to provide? So step one is to register the applications. So B2C only responds to applications that it already knows, much like Azure AD does, right? And there's only one here, but there could be 10, 20, 30, 100, 200 that are federated in different ways according to the policies right, that you set up, all using the same group of users in ways that you want to allow. Just very quickly, this, we've already set this application up, but some key points around it, right, whether or not uh, you want it to be a web, a web API or just a web app. Uh, questions are on which way, where to redirect. At this point, we're going to redirect right back to the browser, to the local host, which means that there's no app in this application. I just want to share it without the app and show you what happens then, and then see what the app receives to then operate on. And the, the key is all about security, so it's the key that your application is going to use when it interacts with B2C to secure and secure the trust between them. So the two things you're going to need in your application typically are the application ID and the secret, which is the key itself. We're not going to touch that further. So you register your apps, and all your developers would come to you to add their applications to the tenant. I'm assuming you're the, the administrator. Number two, the identity providers. You have choices. In this case, there are four. Uh, there are four available currently in this tenant. Uh, one is email, so email or local account. These are the accounts like I showed you earlier. These are accounts that we will exist only inside your tenant. Right? Basically, you're your own IDP in that case. Uh, and the other three have already been set up, Google, Microsoft account, and Facebook. Just to illustrate how easy it is to an identity provider from the ones we've already built in, let's quickly do one of those. So let's do an ad, and I'd like to add LinkedIn. I get to name it the way any friendly name we choose. I'm going to select uh, LinkedIn from the choice, and we will continue to add to these um, according to need and, and demand. Right? And lastly, we're going to set it up. This setup requires a client ID and a client secret. And to get that, I had already gone to the developers. And I think, let me see, I think I already had it here in the favorites. I'd already been before to the developer the LinkedIn site. Any of you can do this. There's no, nothing special about it uh, with my LinkedIn account. And I just went right to, <clears throat> let me go ahead and lo log in. In this case, I will use my real credentials to get into LinkedIn. I've already created an application through this big yellow button here. They make it as simple as possible. And I just want to show you real quick where the, where the credentials come from. I created an application. I chose a logo. I showed a very, very few things, very easy to do. The key elements are the client ID, second, the secret for the app. We can change this later, so uh, the security is, is retained. And lastly, when LinkedIn is done logging the user in, where should they respond back to? So within this list of authorized redirect URLs, your tenant must, be, must appear, otherwise you will not go very far. And here's ProSware B2C1. So basically, I just need to grab, grab the client ID and drop it back over here in this space here, and then come back to grab the client secret. This establishes the trust between B2C and, um, and LinkedIn. Let's correct this. Clean that up. That's really all it takes. Okay. So having done that, I push create, and now I have a new identity provider added to my tenant. This doesn't mean that every policy or every app needs to use it. It just means that it's now available. So let, we'll let this refresh. So what I'm going to do next is create a, create a uh, show you the attributes of the directory where all this, where all this loads. Um, so now I have it here as a choice. Number two, user attributes. This is incredibly useful. You can do very little or you can do a lot. So let me speak very, very, a little bit about it. The user attributes allow you to extend this beyond just a login and authentication system. Right? You can, depending on the situation or what the apps need, increasingly add to the schema of what you use Azure ADB 2 c for. Right? We include a number of pre-established, what we thought might be a, a good starting point for you in terms of what attributes you might already want to use 
to keep track of your customers, right? So you find simple things like city, display name, email, uh, I added that one, given name, job title, et cetera. We did add, we had done it for a particular app, we added gender. Uh, so that was a custom uh, uh, attribute. And think of your schema dynamically changing for every user when you change a, and you add a new attribute. This becomes available for asking customers the information, storing it in the database, and uh, Sorop is going to show you how you can access the database via graph itself directly as well, if that's what you wish to do uh, via APIs. So there's, a, as I said, a pre-built uh, group right there, and I, for example, create one called user type. Just to show how quickly you can create one, it could be that you want to create something called um, favorite player, and you just ask the customer, and I'm just going to, just for my paper, uh, my favorite, this is just for, for a developer to not forget. That's all it takes. I create, and in just doing that, I just change the schema for this directory, right? Without altering any of the existing attributes, obviously. So we let that go through. We seem to have a little slower connection today. We've seen this used for multiple ways. We'll be, with this used in migrations to keep track of unique identifiers in your, in your system. We've seen this used for links between B2C and CRM systems, right? So you can keep track of the user throughout. We've seen this used in, uh, also to get consent, and you also get the questions I, that, be, that Real Madrid asked earlier. Hey, do you approve? Can I mail you stuff? Is it okay if I call you? So all those things can be stored here in a way that every application and even your own CRMs can access and keep track of, right? So for some questions, it could be the source of truth, or it can dynamically sync with an existing system. So I just added an attribute there. Uh, we'll come back to users or groups. And here are the policies. There's some, several pre-built and they kind of speak for themselves, sign up, sign in, profile edit. When a user wants to change their information, change their phone number, change their name, or all the information you allow, or update the email. Password reset, super important. This saves your company money, right? Password reset yourself and don't call me. That still happens a lot, right? So let's do a sign up sign, or signing policy. And very quickly, let's go ahead and add one uh, in a way that will just show you how, how quickly we can get this done, right? So we're going to add a sign up and signing policy. We're going to call it anything you like. You can have one policy per application if you choose, if that's the right thing to do in your, in your environment. Um, for each policy, you get to choose the identity providers. I'm going to choose email, LinkedIn, and Facebook. I could have chosen any, any, other, uh, any other subset of that. Uh, the attributes, these are the questions I'm going to ask the customer when they first create an account. Let's keep it really simple, email address and display name, and let's just say favorite player. Um, next is the application claims. This is the information that your application is going to get from Microsoft, from B2C, when the authentication is complete, from the database, right? A lot of creative things can be done with this. Customizing the interface, distinguishing between standard and premium customers, distinguishing between cust patients that are in the hospital versus outpatient. Uh, any number of things that you think are rich to change the experience that the user is going through, even in the app or on the website, you can populate here so that you can create richer experiences. In this case, let's keep it really simple. I don't want to know the email address, the favorite player, and I'd like to know whether this user is new and their user subject ID, which is the one single number that no matter how the user logs in, you can always go back and identify the user as. I'll choose OK. Multi-factor authentication, we're well, not going to use today, but just, just to show you, it's just a switch to turn on. I, I would like you to experiment when you get back home on how that works. Uh, but very simply calls a number or sends a, an SMS to verify that the person has possession of a device. And page UI customization is super cool. I'm going to let Sorob talk about that. So we're going to create the policy. What, ha what just happens now is that there's a new endpoint inside B2C. Uh, that's called your, uh, in this case, Prosper B2C. And uh, P, question, P question mark equals your policy. Right? This means that through this particular endpoint to log in, only the, the, the things that you declared will happen. Only the IDPs that you showed will be shown. And the bag of the token that comes back will be declared as well. OK, so we successfully created the policy. Let's go ahead and try it real quick. Keep in mind we're only going to come back to, so let me make sure we log out of here. So I want to show you very quick how that how would look, would look like. I'm going to sign out. Okay, and. Again, without code, you're able to verify whether this works the way you want it to before you hand it over to your developers. 
So just do a run now. And this is simulating as if your application would have redirected to, to, to B2C to perform an authentication. Never mind uh, the plain vanilla UI. Uh, uh, Sorup will tell you about that. In this case, a customer is going to sign in for the first time with LinkedIn. See if everything we did was correct. We redirect to LinkedIn. LinkedIn uh, asks for consent. And in this case, I'm going to provide it to the app as a user, not as a developer. And I allow access. This has allowed B2C to allow the app. But in fact, what's represented is the app. Right? So it is your developer code. It is, it is your consent, not ours, that it's being exercised, okay? as I think you would like. And I'm kind of old school, so that's my favorite player. So what's happened now is that these this credentials are getting stored in B2C. This is expected. I mean, I told you there's no app to come back, come back to. I want to stay out of the code part of this. But what just came back to the app is a token. Let's take a quick look at what that token. So basically, the token came back. So this is a success. Let's try. Let's get here this way. End. Great. So we got a token and this whole cryptic thing here. And we're going to decode it, right? Just like your app would under the, any of the libraries you could use from Microsoft or elsewhere, because this is open standards. And if we see what's in that token, here's what came back, right? So your application, in a secure, trusted fashion, just received, right? This particular token has all this information, just to call out a few things for your app to work with, right? So if very few things is the authority that issued the token, right? You know where it came from. Uh, the nonce is something you should use. Basically, the app gives B2C a, an, any, kind of, any kind of number, and, uh, and B2C responds back with that number, so you know that it's coming from the right, right place. Um, also, the IDP that was used, LinkedIn was used in this particular journey. Uh, the, I, the object ID, the unique good of this particular user, that it will never change. This is a new user. Your app can now receive that user, welcome them, send a message to the CRM and say, hey, new user, heads up. Let's start bombarding them with email. No, don't do that, right? Um, and what was the policy that was used to authorize this? So your application can see what was going on. This could have been 100 things. Use it wisely, right? Uh, the can't even what your application really needs. So we just completed authentication. The, the, the just token came back and it was used and consumed. The last thing I want to show you is something that really will have a little resonance if you attended some of the uh, sessions with, uh, with Vittorio. When we go here to back to the policy, one more thing that's really, really, really cool about uh, B2C is when you come down to the token session and SSO configuration. I'm just going to highlight three things here. For each policy, and therefore for each app, if you wish, or for all your apps, if you wish, right? You have the ability to establish the lifetimes of your ID tokens, the lifetimes of your refresh tokens, and the refresh cycle, right? And the session scope. So very quickly, right? What this allows you to say is how long, how long before the user needs to be re-authenticated, right? Uh, in any given session, 60 minutes in this case. Uh, you, could, you could bring it down to one minute you just use. Don't recommend it. But you could make this also 24 hours. Number two, refresh tokens. Hopefully you're somewhat familiar or, or familiar with that, which allows the token to be refreshed without user interaction. Right? You even have the ability to make it not expire so that a user never really has to log in. Depending on your application, that might be appropriate, right? as long as they're, they're, they're sustaining a session in the same browser. Further down, there's a couple other things, but I just want to mention one more, which is what happens down here. Your policy dictates that this particular token is good for any application in this tenant, if you choose tenant. But you could have chosen only those who log in through this policy if, you, if I would have clicked on policy. Right? So only those applications that share the same policy can share this token. Every other application needs to provoke a new authentication, if that's your wish. Right? Or you could have said application. So only this application, right? only this application can do SSO with this token. So it really, you can start thinking about how multiple apps behave differently, how your partners might be given some different attributes in different lifetimes and some different session rights, if that's what you choose. Right? Uh, so this flexibility is at the core of what Real Madrid was trying to achieve and what we think many of you would like to achieve with your application. So let me stop with that. I think we want to continue uh, with some other interesting things that Sarup is going to share with us. Um, we have, uh, we're very proud of the, the, the ability to do this in a, in a quick, snappy way. I've personally learned a ton about identity in doing it here.
Right. Uh, can you guys hear me? Uh, thanks, Jose. Uh, super exciting to be here talking about B2C for the first time at Ignite. Uh, we, we just missed Ignite last year <laughs> because uh, you know, we previewed a few days after. So this is our first opportunity to talk about B2C. So Jose actually gave you uh, one customer story. I'll give you another one uh, really quick. Uh, so this is the state of Indiana, and we actually have two employees from the state who uh, joined us for this session. Thank you. Thanks for coming Thank by, you. and thanks for your partnership. Thank you. uh, they've been like one of our um, you know, closest partners. They've worked uh, with us uh, since preview. And uh, really, they were looking for an identity system that can provide a secure, easy to use, and reliable citizen ID that they could use with all of their applications and government services that they provide online. And in fact, here's a, here's a great quote from Brian Long, who's a cloud architect at the Indiana Office of Technology. Uh, he was uh, one of the key people who worked with us on this project. Now, really, some of these uh, things that he talks about speaks to why they chose B2C and why we think this is an interesting product for you guys as well. Uh, one thing I want to highlight here is that uh, while this was uh, something that they uh, integrated really quickly, they were able to then uh, secure some really high value assets like licenses, taxes, and benefits, and many more uh, going forward, and really focus on generating revenue and providing great services from day one. And that's, that's, uh, that's key to what they're trying to do. All right, so let's actually switch to more demos, uh, you know, since uh, this is going to be more about the product. Let's see, switch back to so I'm actually going to be doing three sets of demos. The first one is about the seamless user experience. Jose kind of hinted at that already. How did Real Madrid actually get that kind of experience that you actually saw? And what are the steps you need to take to go from that sort of default vanilla page that you saw in the demo uh, to something that's, uh, that's rich and compelling? The second is we'll talk a little bit more about this policies and how it interacts with the application. What's the app integration story here? And thirdly, we'll talk about Graph API, which is, uh, which is a cool way to access some of this rich data in the directory. So let's actually first go back to one of these policies that I've already created. I'm going to hit Run Now to show you how that experience actually looks. I'm going to close these other ones out. You see that this is the plain vanilla page that uh, B2C actually renders when you, when you set up the policy and so on. It's actually pretty straightforward. I'm going to click Sign Up now. And it, again, uh, this is very similar to what you saw in the demo before. This is the, your starting point, right? But if you need to actually make it look like an application, and I have an app here, which is a demo app that we had set up for one of our uh, conferences. This is like you know, uh, a wingtip toys, which is like a fictional company that's trying to sell game titles online. They have this really cool looking homepage and they actually want to have an identity experience which matches the coolness of this design, right? So how do, how do you go about doing that? Traditionally, uh, whenever you wanted to customize UI on various services or uh, you know, applications, you had two approaches. One was you could go with some kind of templating systems where you had some limited control over the layout and the text and the colors and the fonts and so on. That is approach A. Approach B would actually be uh, APIs so that you, know, you get to control every element in the page. You could uh, stick in all the controls that you want in the sign up page. In the sign in page, you, know, you could say exactly where that password button should show up, uh, password uh, field should show up, where the sign in button should show up. But we've actually taken a different approach. We've taken an HTML, CSS based approach which relies on cores, which is uh, cross origin resource sharing. And it actually uses some cool JavaScript magic to make all of this work. So let me show you how that works. All right. I'm actually going to start with something really simple. I have this blank HTML page. So I'm actually, you know, it doesn't really render anything. But let's actually look at view source. And I'll just zoom in here. You see that this is the most basic HTML that you can have, right? It's, it's just got a title, uh, empty body, and it's got an, uh, the key thing is it's got an empty div element. And this is going to be important, so if you can remember that the div ID equals API, 
becomes kind of important in, uh, in this discussion. So this is actually a really simple HTML. And let's actually see what happens when I stick it into my policy. Now, this is the part where Jose didn't show you, but actually each page of the experience that this policy renders is fully customizable. So you can actually see that this, when you run this policy, there are four pages that it renders. First is a page which shows you, hey, do you want to use Facebook, Google, LinkedIn? Uh, there's another page where you're collecting data when uh, you're signing up with a local account, which uh, you saw in the Real Madrid demo. There's another page uh, where you get, uh, where, where you sign up users when they're coming in through LinkedIn, which also you saw in the demo. And there's an error page in case of uh, other uh, issues during the user experience. So I'm actually going to switch out from the standard template that was showing you that plain vanilla experience to this plain HTML, and we'll see what happens. So I'm just going to stick in that plain HTML URL. It's actually being hosted in blob storage. Uh, and you know th that's all it is. It's just uh, straightforward HTML. I'm going to save this policy. Let's wait for a second for this to save. So while, while this is actually saving, uh, hopefully it's run. Let's try the run now and see if it's actually updated. You can see that now the experience has changed, right? This is actually even worse than the default vanilla page. <laughs> but it's, it's actually using the HTML that I just plugged in. And I want to show you how it is. But one thing you'll notice, all of these buttons are actually functional. If I click on Facebook, I can go through the exact experience that I went through before. So it's not a broken page at all by any means. It just doesn't look great. So let's try running it again, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Now let's say I do uh, you know, view source, or I inspect this element. right? So Chrome has this great way that you can actually look into. You, can, you notice that now this div ID this whole section all the way from here to here was actually filled in by B2C, while the rest of the elements are your HTML and CSS, basically. So what's happening here is, in the browser, we first download this piece of JavaScript. You can almost think of it like a bootloader in the page. We're downloading this piece of JavaScript. And through cores, we're actually calling out to this HTML endpoint that you saw bringing that in and also injecting our own content, which happens to be all these buttons and forms and so on, merging them together in the client's browser. So that's what's happening here. So uh, this is really a pretty cool way where you can manage your applications pages, its HTML templates and assets, and all of your identity experiences and make it look like you know as pretty as you like and you know design it the way that you want. In fact, just to show you how that will that would work, let's say you're working for that company Wingtip Toys, and you, you came up with some much better HTML than I did. Then you can go back in. I'm going to switch it out to another endpoint. And uh, I have another HTML for the sign up experience as well. Now you see I've actually switched out two separate pages with my own templates. OK, the policy has been successfully updated. I'm actually going to click Run Now uh, to try it all over again. And you can see that the whole experience has changed. It actually looks like wingtip toys. If I were in the app, I clicked on it, and I came to this page, it would look super cool. right? And if I click on Sign Up Now, which takes me to the other page, you can see that that's starting to look great as well. Right? So you, this is how you can see you can start from that really basic HTML, start building out some really advanced uh, experiences uh, like Real Madrid did. 
Now, one thing I should note that all of these are running under login.microsoftonline.com. That's the sort of default thing. Uh, uh, whereas Real Madrid was running on their uh, own URL. Today, that's not like a self-service feature. They actually worked with us to make that happen. And we will provide it as a self-service feature. Uh, and that also gives them the ability to add JavaScript and other things to do even more like cooler magic on, that, on their page uh, uh, compared to what, what I'm showing you right now. So really, this is our story on how you can make each page sort of seamless. Uh, you set up an endpoint, usually on blob storage. It can even be a dynamic app, by the way. So Real Madrid does have an Azure web app, which is spitting out uh, HTML, CSS, because uh, they can actually switch it. They can switch it to experiences based on you know, the country you're coming from, the language. So it can be dynamic. You can do A-B testing. You can imagine all sorts of things, right? Then uh, the second thing is uh, you should put this behind CDN, right? So that you have, uh, because all of this is happening in the browser, so it needs to be pretty quick. We're using a uh, course there. Uh, this is a, just needs to be an HTML5 compliant structure with that uh, div marker that I talked to you about. And we insert all the various elements uh, that, that are required to make this work. All right, so that was uh, about the user experience. Now let's actually talk a little bit more about policies, right? So Jose already mentioned about what uh, policies. You saw that how rich it was. You could set up a lot of things. It's actually a pretty complex document in the uh, behind the scenes. Uh, you can think of B2C almost like a, as a policy execution workflow engine. All it is doing is interpreting the policy when it gets the request. Now, how do, you, how do you as an app developer, when you write an app in various platforms, actually interact with B2C, right? It's pretty straightforward. All you actually need is for your app, which could be hosted anywhere, on Azure, in a different cloud provider, on premises, all it needs to do is make HTTPS calls, like standard protocol requests to the B2C service, and should be capable of receiving tokens on an endpoint, right? That's all it needs. And it's as simple as that. In fact, just to give you a view into how you would integrate the apps, we're not going to do code here, but this is a typical OpenID Connect sign in request. It's a standard protocol request, it's got the standard attributes, it's going to the Microsoft STS, uh, it's referencing the tenant, as you can see. You know, it's got the client ID. Uh, we talked about the redirect URI, which is where we post the tokens back or errors. Uh, it's asking for an ID token. But you'll notice that there's one additional parameter in there, which is P, which is P equals B2C underscore one underscore basic. So this is actually telling B2C to execute that particular policy. And if you saw in the developer console, you can have multiple sign-up policies, multiple sign-in policies, password reset, profile editing policies. And your app can actually call the right policy based on context during the journey of the app as the user interacts with your app. So P is almost like a method overload on top of like an, a standard OAuth protocol request or an OpenID Connect protocol request. So just to kind of play it out in terms of how this would be reusable and the power of this sort of disaggregation of these policies from what uh, the app actually does. Imagine that you're a company Contoso. You have two apps, a shopping app and a pharmacy app. You register them and you have a sign up experience, a sign in experience and a profile edit experience which all of them map to policies in our system. Uh, those are called out as P1, P2, P3. Let's say a user first comes in on his, uh, you know, on, on this cool looking tablet and he clicks on sign up. What your app needs to do is basically just send a request using the app one's client ID to B2C and reference policy P1, which is sign up, right? And we'll return a token. The users, after the user signed up, you know, the session is valid. You know, he, he goes in, he shops online, and he's all happy. Everything works. Now, let's say he goes into a specific part of the app which has like manage my profile. He clicks on profile, that actually becomes another request, which just looks exactly the same. It's, uh, you know, goes to login.microsoftonline.com to the authorize endpoint, but it's calling a different policy. That's all that's changing. Then he clicks on sign out because he's done 
with his, uh, with his shopping experience, then it actually again sends a sign out request and says, hey, sign me out of this particular tenant. Now let's say he comes back later on to the Contoso Pharmacy app and he clicks on sign in. This would now use the app two's client ID and then make a request to the sign in policy. So you can see that this thing is kind of getting boring after a while because it's all about the same request format, response format with just different policy names tacked on, right? And this picture actually gives you a sense of how this can be really powerful. You can have multiple teams within your company independently developing applications but using a standardized set of policies. This immediately gets rid of all those problems of you know, disparate sign up, sign in experiences that people go off and build on their own. And so that way you get to share lots of these things and not just uh, within departments or business units in the same company, you can start seeing this uh, going out to your partners. You can authorize them to use only certain policies so that they integrate with that. So this sort of uh, real time invoking of policies is what really makes this whole thing powerful. And none of this is API driven. It's all about making protocol requests. You can use standard libraries. Microsoft has uh, ship libraries in .NET that are in uh, uh, MSAL, which is Microsoft Authentication Library, is in preview. Other platforms are coming soon, but even third-party libraries are known to work with this kind of a model. All right, cool. Let's do another demo, this time of Graph API. Now, where's all of, uh, so Jose already talked to you about the schema, right? Now, all of this data is actually going into the directory, which is just like another Azure AD tenant. It's a, it's a directory in the cloud. However, it is not a dumb username password database, right? Many apps were written that way, but this is actually a, a managed service data store which has native primitive operations like access control, relationships between objects, uh, you know, data validation, lots of cool things that we've built up over a decade of Azure AD development that you don't actually have to go off and invent in your data layer, right? So uh, Graph API is actually nothing but a RESTful API that allows you to, uh, programmatic access to objects in your directory, especially your users and groups and so on. And I'll show you a few of that um, in this like really quick demo here. So we have this, uh, so we have this simple tool for you to play around with. You can actually download it and try it on your uh, directory as well. It's already set up for my tenant. Uh, this has a bunch of uh, you know, simple commands that you can use to test out how the Graph API works so that you're, uh, th you can get familiar with it. So I'll use some simple commands to show you how this whole thing works. So let's start with get all users, right? Let's scroll back up. You can see that this is actually making a call to an endpoint, which is an Azure AD Graph API endpoint on my particular tenant and saying, get me all the users. And here we have all the users. Uh, I'm sure we can find, the, find Jose as well in there uh, because he just registered with uh, LinkedIn. You can see Jose's user object is showing up here. This, he just signed up and it's, this data is available in the directory. There, there are a few interesting things here. If you actually pick up his uh, object, you'll see that there's this thing called object ID, which he, we already talked about. It's the unique identifier, which is globally unique across all of Azure AD, really. So you can uh, safely actle your applications on this particular uh, identity. His name. I'll talk a little bit more about other mails and things of that sort, but really you see that all of the data that he plugged in, like Maradona being his favorite player, shows up through Graph. Now, you, not only do you actually uh, just read, you can even, uh, sorry, create users. So you can imagine this being some sort of a migration scenario. You already have, uh, you, you already have users in your existing databases, and you want to create them in the directory. So this is just doing a post request on the same graph endpoint and then saying, hey, I want to create a new user with username this time. It's not an email address. 
uh, usernames that are useful if you're like trying to build gamer tags or if you have legacy systems. Uh, with Joe Consumer, these, this is his password, and I'll talk a bit more about password policies and so on. And this actually creates the user as well. So, so this was create. We did read, and I'll do a quick one uh, for search. Search is also interesting because this actually provides you So the user I just created was, was Joe Consumer one so I can find that user that I just created. So it, you can think of this as a lookup scenario for some of your backend applications, for example. So just to recap, Graph API is a RESTful API that's used for all kinds of programmatic access. It's an OData 3 compliant service. Mainly the use cases here are you know, uh, migration, profile lookup, uh, call center back office uh, apps. Now many of you ha are familiar with Azure AD and on-prem AD, so uh, I wanted to call out a few differences in the object model which, uh, you know, in case you're trying to transition your knowledge over to this space would be useful. First is B2C doesn't use user principal name, UPN. Uh, we actually generate like a random GUID. Uh, we don't use that during sign up or sign in. It, it's just there in the directory but it's, it's a random GUID for all your concern, right? Sign-in names is the actual login property that we use, uh, which could have been Joe Consumer one in that case, or any email, and, uh, any email address. Uh, we also tag it, saying this is a username or an email, so we can drive different experiences on it. Uh, in the future, we'll be uh, adding more things like phone number, and you can add your own stuff like, hey, this is member ID, or you know, things of that sort, so you can, have various kinds of login identifiers in there. Creation type says that this is a local account or not. Password policies is interesting. We actually added this. Uh, uh, there used to be a flag to disable password expiration, but we are uh, we've added this to uh, to disable strong passwords as well. So when you actually create users, you can actually write users with uh, you know lower complexity passwords into the directory to help aid with migration. So that you know we know that not all of them will have the Azure AD password complexity in there. There is a hidden, there are a, couple, a few hidden fields in there. There's one called the linked account, which is where we actually store the LinkedIn or the Facebook username, uh, uh, sorry, user ID, so that we know, hey, this person is coming in from Facebook and how do we tie it to the object in the directory. This also gives us the ability to link various credentials into the same user. Uh, there are a couple uh, that we use for uh, email verification, which Jose showed you. Uh, where, so that we can reset your password with confidence because we have verified that email through a one-time code. That's stored in StrongAuth email, and StrongAuth phone is used when we do multi-factor authentication. And custom attributes is where we store things like favorite player, gender, things that you extended your schema of to, and other mails is what Real Madrid uses when they want to communicate with you. Uh, that's what you did when you opted in during their sign-up form. So all of these properties have various uh, Access levels, validation rules, uh, you know, different apps of different privileges can read and write from them. So these things are already inbuilt in the directory so that you don't have to go off and sort of invent all of that access control layer on top of uh, a database, for example. All right, so just uh, heading to the sort of final stretch here, we have uh, 14 minutes, so I'll try to wrap up quickly. You know, you can forget all that I said, you can look it all up. But if you have to like, take one message uh, today from our talk, is that don't build your own. We've talked to hundreds of customers over the last few years, and we've seen some common problems which are really hard to overcome. You might overcome some of them, but all of them together is a hard challenge. right? And you would rather be focused on doing other things. First is security and privacy. Uh, we've had customers with 1,500 apps which have 1,500 application databases behind them with various password credentials of various strengths and so on, spread all across the data center, and it's just really hard to track. Kim Cameron, who's a distinguished engineer at Microsoft, uh, he wrote and popularized the seven laws of identity. Uh, you know, he's really, like, uh, you know, the B2C is one of his brainchild, really. He likes to use the term operational commonality, which is an advantage of Azure AD, which is we run 
10 million plus uh, directories, enterprises, in the same exact way operationally, right? We use the same systems, the same processes, the same code base, and that's, that's an advantage because although it, it makes it a target, we have a smaller surface area to control, whereas most customers don't have that luxury. Total cost of ownership, I won't repeat the points that Jose made, but really the other uh, aspects of this about the directory is that the data that you saw is stored in three different data centers. It's actually, actually replicated to three different data centers. So building that kind of high availability uh, disaster recovery, which is built into the platform, is also pretty challenging. We have seen in uh, scalability and elasticity being a problem. Uh, like uh, some people, they just buy larger and larger boxes to host their Oracle servers, and you know, uh, holiday season comes by, and then they have to really uh, plan for the capacity and then take it down and the peak load goes down. And Real Madrid has to do this every weekend, so you know, that would be super hard if they had to do it themselves. But with the cloud, it can, uh, you know, it can scale. And finally, the, the biggest cost that people don't realize with uh, disparate systems is Swaroop in that Contoso shopping uh, app, is it the same Swaroop in the Contoso pharmacy app if I built it in two different uh, systems? It's hard to tell. So that makes it hard for you as a business to cross-sell, upsell services, which is a huge loss. And so at this point, I'll uh, hand it over to Jose to kind of uh, round out the presentation. Thank you, sir. So uh, I hope you like what you've, you've seen. Do you like it? Yes? Cool stuff. But you're wondering, well, how much is the cost, right? Yes, but how much are you going to take off, right? And this, it only gets better, right? It only gets better. We're going to go through this very quickly because we want to get questions. Was there a comment or a question? Oh, oh, no, it's not that good. <laughs> no, actually, it is free up to 50,000 users and 50,000 authentications a month. How about that, right? So, so we want you to get started. We want to use, begin to use it, right? And super quick, right, we already talked about the first two things. Uh, the key point of our line with business objectives is that our, our there's some complexity to our pricing, I'm going to be honest. But it is there because we want to price to your needs. Right? We, want to, we don't want to give you one standard price that you know, it's, it's unfair to some and an advantage to others. We want it to scale with however need you, you use it. Right? So three meters, number of stored accounts. Uh, number two is number of authentications. And number three, number of multi-factor authentications used. Those are expensive, right? so we do have to charge you for them. Uh, but I'm not going to get into the dollars and cents except on my next slide. That just key, key to know that that's how the meters operate. So it's based on your usage, much like other Azure appliances and other Azure services. It's based on usage, not on a license, right? Which is really an advantage for some of you who have very, very low usage, but still want to enjoy the scale, still want to enjoy all the security. You can get this at you know, a, a bargain, and I'll show you why. So if we look to it, at, we, what we did is we took five use cases, right? We looked at publicly available data. Right, of LinkedIn all the way to the right, and a, a bank website in the UK that we know, know well, and a couple of applications that we've come to know. And we said, what are the usage rates in terms of how many customers are active, how often do they authenticate, how often would they be using MFA? Right? So those three meters are laid out in those colors, right? from red is user, blue is authentication, and yellow being MFA. What would be the cost for a million users, this is normalized, right? A million users for a year Right? At the bargain basement price off, right? So this is what it looks like. Right? So depending on those expected usage rates, we believe this to be illustrative, right? It is usage based, you're right, your mileage may vary. But based on uh, what we consider our conservative estimates based on data we got from, from these five different types, this is what it looks like. Folks, we're talking about six, four, thirteen, ten cents per user per year, right? I'm sure you can make that work. Right? We're making this so that it, it makes sense for you. We are actually interested in enhancing security across the internet. This is not something we're trying to in any way make it any kind of gigantic profit from at all. Right? We're bringing the scale to bear so you guys can, can tap into it and leverage it for your, for your applications. Um, it gets really interesting as well because the user, right? you only pay for a user once in the, in the meter. And as you add more apps, you only pay for more authentications when you think about it. Right? I know you might have a lot of questions about this, but I just wanted to give you the kind of the, the, the quick kind of thumbnail takeaway. It's like you could be talking between three, four to ten, fifteen cents per user per year. See if you can make that work. I bet you can. Um, 
is it right for you? I hope by now that you are creating that in your minds, whether it's right for you or not, right? Multiple personas in your company might be interested, right? Uh, so the key points are, look, a, they, this covers almost any kind of industry that might have these needs. Uh, we, we, we sit to cover every platform. We don't want to leave any stone unturned. We want it to make it work, work for you. Uh, there is a question that we just want to quickly touch on, and this will continue tomorrow with Sarat. Around, but wait a minute. It, I have partners, but they are sometimes their customers, sometimes their partners. How do I make those decisions? Just, I want to refer you to a few questions, right? You should answer the questions first and then ask the technology questions, right? We are purposely adding features for B2B that are all about collaborating with partner organizations and collaborators. These are the people who are likely to sit in a desk right next to you, working with you in your office, right? You're going to share apps. You're going to share resources, printers, right? They're almost employees, not quite, but they're in there, right? They're, these are what we call partners. This is what B2B is for. There's a, a collaboration. There's a broad, broad sharing of applications and information that you do with true partners. That's what B2B is for, right? Those people come to you, and they're not themselves. They represent some organization, right? And we want to treat them that way. And the features that we're going to keep building and adding to B2B are along that vein, right? On the other side, B2C are for people, let's call it what it is. You might not know them, right? Arm length, right? Uh, these users are not going to see each other, so the visibility is very different. Uh, you're unlikely to want to put them in, in multiple different groups and manage them and put workflows to allow them in. These are customers. They can come and go as they please, and that's what B2C is for. More questions, we can continue later or even tomorrow with Sarat. Sarat, just raise your hand. Just tackle him. <laughs> So with that, uh, sir? Yeah, just to end this out, uh, to leave some time for questions. So we've already talked about scale, about this being about ecosystem of apps so that they all deal with the same unified view of the user. Uh, and a couple of other things. One is like we have user insights across multiple tenants. We know which sign up uh, works, which uh, you know, sign ins are better, uh, latencies, things of that sort. We're looking to aggregate and provide richer data so you can make better decisions for your enterprise. And finally, you know, that operational commonality term comes up again. We're part of the Azure AD family. We are built on the same secure infrastructure. And you'll see like more stories around security in B2C and other aspects of it all kind of tying together over time. These are some resources. Uh, the main thing I want to point out is we are quite active on user voice. So, you know, we don't claim to be a finished article by any means, but we do listen to uh, votes on user voice. Uh, we do respond. We are quite active out there. And those are our coordinates if you want to reach out to us. And you know, we'll stay here for questions and also take some um, at the uh, outside at the end of the talk. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, guys. So, so we have five minutes of the official talk. If anybody has questions, please uh, feel free to go to the mic. We'll answer them. If not, we'll stay back as yep, well. Yep, we'll stay here. Question? Oh, no. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Jose. Yeah. Yes, there's a question. Nice to meet I don't you. think it's on. Um, we, we've uh, been part of the private preview. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. Let's, let's, let's so let's the question finish. is how does uh, Real Madrid no, 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 deal with European compliance? So I guess each customer has to make their own decision. Like, I can't speak to Real Madrid itself because, uh, you know, uh, that they'll have to. But what we have is today we are generally available in North America. So if you create a tenant in North America, your data stays within North America. Our European uh, tenants, uh, that data stays within Europe, the, uh, within Europe, and that's already true today. And uh, we have another region, Asia Pack, coming up early next year. So these will be the three main regions where your data will stay. And if that meets your requirements or not, we can have further conversations based on that. But that's the starting point of the data residency story. Uh, yes, you could do that. Uh, uh, so the, the comment being, yes, uh, your app. We, we've had customers who have written apps for different countries, and they have different backing tenants for that, if, if that is really required. But obviously, having a global store has its advantages, too, because you know, uh, it really depends on your business use case. Thank you. Yes? So the question is, does this work with ADL.NET SDK? So we've actually released the next 
iteration of that called msal.net, which is called Microsoft Authentication Library.net. Uh, that works with B2C. So you should use that. And also, uh, the MSAL will be released in other platforms soon over the next few months. And all of those will be designed to work both against Azure AD and B2C. So that way, you don't have to learn multiple libraries. Yes, uh, the msal.net already works with Xamarin. There's a sample out there in, a, in, the, in the samples repository that I showed you. Cool. Uh, last question before, and then we can have some private questions. So the question is, can you associate multiple social accounts with a single user? Uh, we have the capability in the directory. I showed you the concept of linked accounts, which can be multiple social accounts on the same user. We just haven't built an account linking experience as yet, and that's in, on the roadmap. Okay, thank you. Thanks.